So we will break down some of our literary elements used by Kurt Vonnegut in Harrison Bergeron. So for a type of narration, we can say it is third person narrator. This is evident from the narrator's focus on the thoughts and experiences of Hazel, such as when George reflects on the noise in his ear and Hazel's inability to think deeply. I'm going to put this down here because we have predominantly, that would be your point of view. And then for this, the narration is third person. We can say there is an unknown narrator telling the reader the events. So we have an unknown narrator. And we know it was tragic, but George and Hazel couldn't think about it. So our narrator is not in the story, third person. And then our point of view, we can say it's going to be the reader this Vonnegut uses a third person limited point of view. This is evident from the narrative's focus on thoughts and feelings, experiences of George and Hazel. And our setting, obviously, we have a dystopian setting. Now, it is the year 2081, but you can think, because technically that's about 55 years away for us, but for Kurt, it would have been over 100, and it would have been about 120 years away. So also interesting to know, we're on our 211th amendment. As of 2024, there are 27 amendments in the United States Constitution. So that can always tell, that gave us an idea if he didn't tell us it was 2081. And then we also want to describe our setting and we need to mention this authoritarian government and a handicapper general. And obviously this name in and of itself is, you could say this is irony and it comes up several times. So it's also going to be a motif, the mentioning of a handicapper general. I'll put that there. All right, so we have everything, everyone needs to be equal. Nobody can be smarter or better looking. No one can be stronger or quicker. And then we also know I introduced Diana Moon Glampers. I will put her in our character section. Um, she's going to be the keeper of order. Uh, she wouldn't be the president, but obviously in the end, she you could say she's the antagonist, but technically the government as a whole would be the antagonist in this Harrison Bergeron story. All right, and uh, I would also want to put, uh, we could say something, um, the story unfolds in the Bergeron household where Jordan H. Lewis average class are forced to wear handicaps. Um, I could put that. Um, in the story, people are forced to wear handicaps in order to remain equal with their, with, with fellow citizens. There we go. And I have this like so. So that would be our point narration, point of view, and setting. We can also see here, so the setting, we have it in 2081, we described the type of government, but it is in a family home. And the family is watching what is transpiring in a television studio. So we could say that this setting is Kurt Vonnegut's attempt to show readers um, the power of government involvement in media, especially since a government official comes and shuts it all down. And then Greg, George and Hazel totally forget. I have our characterization. Now, okay, my one critique in the story is that Hazel is supposed to be perfectly average intelligence. So she couldn't think about anything except in short bursts. But she also can't remember anything. So she doesn't even remember her watching the show when her son is killed. Um, neither does George. So I wouldn't refer to this as a, an intelligence issue. It almost is here. So we have them. It's all kind of mixed up in my mind. Forget sad things, I always do. This is characterization. She's obviously optimistic. <laughs> but I did, as far as the story, 
she would be characterized as be having low, below average intelligence. But I'm making an interpretation. These symptoms are more aligned with like a memory issue or a recall. She doesn't have the ability to recall anything. Kind of like uh, the fish in Dora <laughs> or Nemo. Um, and then George, I have him lighthearted, intelligent, although it's stunted. And then Harrison. Now, Harrison is a little tricky because um, he's supposed to be characterized as intelligent. I mean, he's good looking. I wouldn't say um, that's more of a description. But he is basically forcing this girl to dance with him. Um, and under the threat of uh, he was going to kill her. And then when Miss um, Diane Moon Glambers comes. He was, uh, he gets killed immediately. He doesn't have the chance of, uh, like, surrendering here. But you could also say, when he comes, he says, I am the emperor. Do you hear me? I am the emperor. Now, this doesn't exactly sound like somebody who was <laughs> going to, I don't know, lead the nation into democracy. So I could say characterization. You might say, characterize him as arrogant, and even here, um, he had said something, he would make them, he's going to select an empress, um, let the first woman who dares rise to her feet, claim her mate and her throne. So one ballerina uh, finds this offer appealing, and then he also is talking about play me your best. Okay, this is barons, dukes, and earls. This would be a reference to feudalism. This is a reference to feudal societies where a king owned all, owned a great region of land, while barons, earls, and dukes rented it for either they were like in favor of the, the king or however you would say but this is a reference that a society with barons dukes and earls is most definitely not a democratic one so we could say that uh harrison could be characterized as arrogant authoritarian maybe and then diana moon glampers she is going to be uh, she can be characterized as decisive, that's for sure, and authoritarian, um, author authoritative, there we go, decisive, because she makes a split-second decision to kill Harrison, and the poor ballerina that just was basically threatened to dance with him, which was messed up, but, alright, so, if we go into our characters, we can say character versus self could be both George and Hazel, they are hampered by their handicaps. Actually, we could specifically say George. So at the start of the story, um, George, George faces a character versus self conflict when his wife, Hazel, uh, tells him it is all right to remove his handicaps. Um, the reader can see that George is dedicated to his country's laws because he will not take off his handicaps, even when he is in the privacy of his own home. You could say that's a conflict because technically, if Hazel and George don't even know that their son was killed. They know he was arrested, but to say that it's a conflict, they don't even realize it's happening. So we could mention that. It's important to note that. Um, here they're watching television, but she'd forgotten everything they forget. And we could say, uh, here's one, wait. George was toying with this vague notion. So, 
for this line here, we could maybe say, I could say it's the conflict, right? And I will say character versus society. George has a conflict with his society because of his above average intelligence. Actually, that would go into nature here. So this goes into the nature section because George and Harrison both have this conflict. Their above average intelligence has resulted in them wearing this and intelligence would be a nature. Um, so wait, George has a conflict because a conflict with nature, with nature because of his above average intelligence and the society he lives in made this illegal. All right, so when we say his conflict with society because he has a notion that citizens should not be forced to hamper their talents talents, abilities, and identities due to government policies. So that would be one. And then our character versus technology, we can say that's Harrison, and we can also say George because he has the, um, that is a, the handicaps he's, the, the government's putting on are considered technologies. And then the mood of this story is supposed to be we could say the mood of the story is sarcastic and shocking in order to get readers to think about laws surrounding equality. That would be his point. And you could say the tone is the same. In this case, the tone of the story and the mood of the story really are similar. The mood really though is how the reader feels. So for me you might have been shocked and surprised that this was happening in the story but obviously mood is up to the reader. For imagery we can definitely talk about the uh, scene where they're flying through the air. So we have it sound like oh wait for imagery George and Hazel Anytime we're hearing sounds, um, Vonnegut uses imagery to describe life under government-issued handicap devices. Um, George and Hazel can be seen sitting in their living room having a conversation in front of the television. However, a loud sound will cause George to, we can say, recoil, recoil in pain. That would be our example of imagery. And then the symbolism. All right, so this is what I would use to write um, a text-only analysis. I will talk about the symbolism. We can the television is a symbol. So the television in the story is used to symbolize George, we can say George and Hazel's only view of the outside world that is allowed by the government. And then you could say the television is state-sponsored considering in the story's resolution it is cut off air. So you could say the television represents propaganda. Um, if I say more, we can say Vonnegut uses the television to symbolize the government's use of propaganda to control and subdue the population. That would be a major symbol. They're both sitting there watching TV, and it's the only way they even hear about 
their son, which obviously they forgot about, are foreshadowing. You could say that this is a short one, but when they mentioned George, it was all tragic. They couldn't think about it. Um, they were watching on the television. Wait, when they say... Once he starts to think about his son, here, he began to think glimmering about his abnormal son, who is now in jail. We could say this is foreshadowing, because then, bam, Harrison shows up on the television. So we could say George is thinking about Harrison on page two of the text, which results in Harrison emerging on the state-sponsored program the couple is watching. The motifs could also be, we could say, the television is a motif. The handicaps themselves are motifs. Um, we could say the, handy, the mention of the handicaps are just motifs showing how, uh, how controlled these people are. That even like... Um, the handicaps worn by the characters are motifs to show how much control the government has over the lives of the citizens. By making the handicaps for Harrison, we could even say comically ridiculous. Um, Vonnegut uses this motif to continue to develop the idea that government control will continue and increase until people stand up to authority. Something along those lines. That could be a motif. How a motif builds a central idea. We have the ridiculous, at one, when we get to the end, his handicap was like a clown nose and the snaggle teeth. We could say that that motif is building this idea that people in this society are just so, uh, maybe you could say like sheep, um, they will conform to anything the government's going to tell them. All right, and then we can have here our irony. It's ironic that we could say Harrison's demise is ironic because he was so strong and powerful and he was calling everyone to action, but in the end, he is immediately taken out by the handicapper general. So you could say it is ironic that Harrison is so powerful and intelligent. However, he is immediately killed by a government, um, by a handicapper general, by a <laughs> HG handicapper general. And then you could also say it's ironic that George and Hazel aren't even going to know that this happened to them or their son. And then all the um, different types of themes you have individual, what is fair, is, we can say, is fairness and equality the same thing? You can say, how much power should a government have over its citizens? That's definitely one. You can have, uh, should dangerous criminals be executed on site rather than face a trial. You could say that he was killed right away by the government. He was also detained. You could say like the themes surrounding government um, detention, any of those would do. And we also have quite a lot of 
figurative language here, even here, his mind instantly, the realization was blasted from his head instantly by the sound oh, blasted from his head. Technically, um, something, an idea doesn't get blasted out of your head. So you could say that is either hyperbole or a metaphor. This would be a metaphor. And I'll put here figurative language, and you can fill these out too in anything you find for figurative language. So I'm going to put figurative language metaphor here. There we go. Out there metaphors, when Harrison comes out, we have like wet tissue paper. He's tearing through them. This is going to be a simile. So I'll say figurative language. Oops. Uh-oh. Simile. And my disc is full, so I'll have to do that. <laughs> Here's the part where you could say it got very sarcastic. His rubber ball nose. In the next episode, next episode, in the next video, we'll work, look at the literary analysis essay.